Welcome to Probabilistic Machine Learning, lecture number nine. Here we are in the course. As always, we saw that in lecture number one that probabilistic reasoning is a way to introduce uncertainty into the more restricted process of propositional logic by distributing truth over entire spaces of hypotheses. Doing so can be computationally hard because it means keeping track of a potentially combinatorially large space. So we need various computational tricks, computational and modeling tricks, to make this work in practice. One of them is to use conditional independence structure to simplify certain parts of the computation. Another one is to use random numbers, Monte Carlo methods, drawn from probability distributions to compute quantities like moments, in particular means and variances and also evidences for probabilistic reasoning. A third option is, or at least a third tool in our toolbox, is to specifically choose certain probability distributions that are amenable to certain operations. Maybe the most important relationship between variables is the linear one, matrices. And we saw in the past two lectures, actually three lectures, that the right probability distribution for this operation, the one that is particularly well adapted to this linear relationship is the Gaussian distribution. We learned in uh, lecture number seven that we can use this Gaussian distribution not just to learn to do inference on variables that are linearly related and jointly Gaussian distributed, but even to use this framework to learn nonlinear functions and thereby to solve one of the key tasks of machine learning, which is supervised learning of, specifically in this case, real valued function. So that's regression. To do so, we distributed a set of features over an input domain and assigned weights to these features to create functions put Gaussian distributions over those weights. Now if you make Gaussian observations of these individual, and not of the individual uh, features, but of the function, which is a linear combination of the features at various points, then we can compute posterior distributions over the function and also the underlying weights. In the last lecture, we spoke about how to learn these features. That's one of course, obvious challenge that you have to choose which features you're going to use. So in the last lecture, we found one particular approach to this problem, which is to fit these features. This means that we, while sort of keeping our nod to the probabilistic framework, essentially decide not to keep track of an entire space of hypotheses anymore, but just to optimize within the space of hypotheses such that the probability of this particular choice of features is maximized. We made a connection of this idea to the vastly popular area of deep learning by noticing that we can write this process of learning weights in a Gaussian fashion and fitting the parameters of the features by maximum likelihood, type 2 maximum likelihood or maximum a posteriori to essentially learning a deep neural network. Well, deep. In this case, it's just a two-layer neural network where one layer is integrated out and one layer is specifically fitted. Of course, you could add more layers and then it truly becomes a deep neural network. That's more of a parameterization issue. Today, we're going to look at another idea, which is, at least intuitively speaking, the orthogonal one to this approach. So what we did, in the last lecture was to say, okay, we're going to use these individual features. Let's say there are nine of them. Which ones should they be so that the process works as well as possible? Now, another option is to say, maybe um, we can use more features and increase the number of features. And if we do that, then, okay, maybe things will become more, more expensive and we'll have to deal with the expense that comes from that. And let's think about what we can do about this. But maybe if you increase the number of features, then the individual feature isn't that important anymore. And if you have a lot of features, then the algorithm will somehow just fit, like, still pick out 
an interesting function or a span an interesting hypothesis space even if the features are not particularly specifically chosen to be, to be particularly good. This will give rise to a beautiful concept or a beautiful conceptual framework that is still very popular in machine learning and is maybe one of the two foundations next to deep learning in the modeling space because it will turn out that it's actually possible to do this process with infinitely many features. And we'll see today how that works. So to get to this point, I first need to start by cleaning up our notation a little bit from the previous lecture. So here is our posterior distribution over the function values, given some observations y at locations x, and a specific choice of features phi. This is what the posterior distribution looks like on paper if we assign a weight uh, a Gaussian distribution over the weights with mean mu and covariance matrix sigma. By now you've seen this expression several times and maybe they've become less scary even though they're still so ex extremely long and so tedious to look at. Now before we look into complicated math you can still settle down and follow along without stressing your brain too much. The first thing we're going to do is just to clean up our code a little bit and to do so we just look at the, the expressions in here and notice that there is a certain kind of types of structures in here that show up quite a lot. So if you look at where phi actually, the features actually play a role in this expression, then you see that there are two types of expressions that involve phi. One of them is an inner product between phi and mu, the mean of the weights. This one shows up here and here with two different phi's. In this case it's the features of the output, the prediction points, and here is the features of the input, the test points, uh, sorry, the training points. And then there's another expression, which is this one and this one, and this one, this one, this one, and this one. Oh, it shows, it shows up quite a lot. So what this is, is an inner product between one feature vector, the prior covariance of the weights, and another feature vector. And interestingly, there is no expression in here where phi is, where there's a lonely phi, if you like, where there's just a, a feature vector lying around that isn't multiplied with anything. So therefore, we actually don't really need in our code an explicit place for this feature phi. Instead, we could pre-compute or define functions that, uh, that encapsulate this, these two operations and then that will clean up our code because then we can recall these um, operations on these various combinations of little x and capital X. And we'll give a name to these two objects. This one will be called the mean function because it's a function that is applied to the mean. And the other one is the inner product between two feature vectors weighted by the prior covariance of the weights. And we can use two different names for this because they are historically connected to different ideas. From the Gaussian perspective, this is a covariance function because it describes the covariance between two function values at location A and B, but it's much more prominently connected to the word kernel. Why is this a kernel? Well, the word kernel is overloaded in mathematics to mean many different things, but here it means that there is an, uh, an inner operation that is done a lot of times here and that actually builds the core of our entire process. So that's the kernel of our model, if you like. So what do I mean by that? Well, or why is it important to do this? Why is it helpful to do so? Well, let's look at our code again. So here I have the code that we already used in um, lecture number six um, for regression, sorry, lecture number seven for regression which um, I've just cleaned up a little bit. So what you can see here is I'm just loading a bunch of uh, Python libraries and then um, in that lecture number seven 
we did parametric regression by first defining the features. Here I'm using these bell-shaped features, the ones that look a little bit like, a, well, that are a Gaussian curve, they're not a Gaussian distribution, they're just bell-shaped, but it doesn't matter, right? You saw that we could use all sorts of different features to do this kind of regression. Um, then we define the prior space over the weights for these features, for that we need to know how many of these features there are, let's call that f, and then we create prior mean and covariance, mu and sigma. And then we had in lecture number seven, by now you've seen this code, this piece of Python code that just does a parametric regression for us. And it computes these quantities, the mean on the, the function value means on the test points, function value covariances on the test points, function value samples and uh, error bars, so the sausage of uncertainty around the mean. It loads some data, then produces, computes a posterior by computing a posterior function value mean, posterior function value covariances, and um, by, by doing, it does that by, uh, you know, solving a complicated um, uh, linear equation using Cholesky decompositions to make them efficient, and that gives us our posterior function value means, posterior function value covariances, posterior function value samples, and posterior function value error bars. Now, we again, we see that there are all these expressions with uh, um, inner products in here. Wherever there is an at, so a matrix vector product, there are these um, operations with phi. So here is inner product between phi, sigma, phi, inner product between phi, sigma, phi, inner product, and so on, up here. So that's a little bit tedious, so let's clean up our code a bit and instead we define, having defined the features above, we define these mean this mean function and the kernel. But to just say these are both functions that take inputs, evaluate the features of the inputs, either just one feature or two features or two inputs, and then take the inner product of those feature matrices essentially in this case with um, the prior covariance or prior mean of the weights. If we do so, then we can rewrite our code, and I've already done that here a little bit to simplify things later on. I've now actually defined a function which does this regression for us. It's a Gaussian parametric regression, if you like, <clears throat> for the moment. Um, and it actually does the exact same bit. It's the same code. I've just cleaned up a little bit. So first of all, I'm now creating a dictionary to return the output so we can reuse this code over and over again. But um, I'm still calling the prior mean. So now, instead of using the inner product, I'm just calling the mean function. And, and I need the prior covariance. And instead of calling explicitly the inner product, I'm just using this abstraction called the kernel. That means I can still draw samples. I can still compute the posterior error bar. I can still load data. And I can now also compute the posterior distribution by Calling the, constructing the exact same quantities, but wherever there used to be an inner product in the previous code, I've just replaced it with the mean function or the covariance function. Of course, this code is going to be on Elias, so you can check it out later on. And then um, here is still a bit of complicated plotting code that produces this kind of output. So um, I should probably run this a little bit so that we get to actually see what's happening. So Whoop. Let's just run that once. Whoop. And here is our posterior distribution that we already know from a previous lecture. So here, this is the smooth posterior distribution which we get because I'm using these Gaussian features in here, which are these sort of Gaussian little, little bumps, so they give quite smooth posteriors. Okay, so that's fine. And this is actually an easy spot for you to take a quick break. Um, so that was actually a nice little warm-up exercise. We've just seen that we can clean up our code by uh, introducing simple objects called the mean function and the kernel function, which are really just encapsulations of these operations, of these inner products of feature vectors with their means. Um, this seems almost trivial, and actually it is, but it's going to empower us in a moment to do something absolutely amazing, which is to increase the number of features to infinity. To infinity, you say? 
how is that going to work? Well, now that we have this structure called a kernel, that's going to be the particularly interesting one, the mean function is going to be almost trivial to deal with, we can think a little bit about what exactly is happening inside of that kernel and see if we can use some cool mathematical tricks to empower this operation more. So let's look at this expression again. Um, let's say for simplicity, um, that that's not actually necessary, it just simplifies the argument, um, that our prior covariance is independent. So that the sigma matrix is just a unit matrix times a bunch of constants. So here I've already chosen the constants in a very convenient way because I'm going to use particular features that start on the, that, that are distributed over our input domain from the left to the right. They have a rightmost end, that's, let's call that C max, and a leftmost end, let's call that C, C min, and they are F of these features. But it doesn't really matter, I've just chosen this expression so that the remaining derivation is going to become easier. And then there's a constant in front which can be anything. So because that constant can be anything, you can also forget about these numbers for a moment. It's just going to simplify the argument. So let's say that our prior covariance is a diagonal matrix. Then what is this inner product? This inner product is just a sum. It's a sum that sums up the values of all the feature functions at the pair xi and xj. So at the two input locations xi and xj. And xj, xi and xj might be individually part of the test set or the training set the plotting locations or whatever, they're just inputs. The fact that these xi and xj go in here is not going to be that interesting for a moment. The more interesting bit is this bit up front here. So what we're computing is a sum. Now, sums of course are things that computers are good at, but they are also things that mathematics allows us or has provided us with interesting tools for. And in particular, there are certain sums that remain tractable even as the number of entries in the sum goes to infinity. Because they have a certain structure that allows us to write down an analytic form of the value of the sum regardless of how many entries it has. One example of that are sequences, which you've probably seen in your undergraduate math lecture in your first year. Another example, which you know even since high school, are integrals, which are infinite sums that have such a structure that you still know what the value of the infinite sum is because it's the area under some curve without having to do the infinitely long sequence of summing up arbitrarily large, like infinitely many, sometimes even uncountably infinitely many, individual segments. And we're going to use this idea for specific choices of features to allow our model our neural network, if you like, for which we're doing Bayesian inference with Gaussian weights, to be infinitely large. So we're going to add infinitely many features and in doing so make our neural network infinitely wide. And the only trick, the only on a lever we're going to pull is that we're not just going to put arbitrary features in there, we're going to specifically choose certain features and place them in a very regular fashion and that regularity is going to allow us to deal with infinitely many features. So let's do that now in a derivation that is actually due in this particular specific form to David Mackay again. But it's a generic kind of derivation that um, you can actually do for various features and in fact we will do it for various features today. So let's say that we choose this particular family of features, these Gaussian features that I've used on previous slides. So let me just go back so you see what I mean again. It's this kind of situation. So we have these little, in the background, blue bumps. Those are our Gaussian features. And there are, in this plot, there are 16 of them. They go from minus 8 to plus 8. Each of these features has a location. In this case, the location is 5. In this case, the location is 3. Here, the location is minus 2, right? And then they all have a certain width, which we just fix to be a certain width. And they are regularly distributed across this domain. We're going to keep this structure. And these features start, by the way, at a rightmost end, or they start at a leftmost end, if you like, that's at minus eight, and they go to a rightmost end, which is at plus eight. Okay, let's see what we can do with that. So here are our features again, now with a bit more symbols. That's what the features look like. They are exponentials of squares, negative squares. Um, each of these features has a location, CL, so that's the numbers from minus eight to plus eight, in this case, of the plot. 
and they have a width lambda but we'll keep that width constant in this case and the plot that I just showed you lambda was actually one but of course it doesn't have to be one. Now let's see what this particular form gives us if we plug it into this generic expression up here for the inner product between features. So we'll just do that. Here is our expression. We've decided to use our diagonal covariance matrix. Again, we could of course use a different covariance matrix, but I've decided to use a, a diagonal one because it makes it very easy to do this derivation. Then what we get is, so from above here, right? We just, this one we just copy down, and here we just plug in the values of these features. So the only difference between these two features is that they are evaluated at different locations. One at xi and the other one at xj. Now, what can we do with these features? Well, these are Gaussian features, so they are exponentials of squares. And they're not Gaussian probability distributions, and the fact that they are of this Gaussian shape has nothing to do with the fact that we're doing Gaussian inference. It's just a choice of feature. But the product of two exponentials of squares is the exponential of a sum of squares, and a sum of squares is still another sum of squares where you can do quadratic, uh, quadratic completion and um, extract individual terms, right? So the product of two Gaussians is another Gaussian times a normalization constant. The same al like algebraic structure or arithmetic structure al almost is something we can use here. So we can um, multiply these two exponentials. That's the exponential of a sum. That'll give us two square terms in xi and xj, both containing X, uh, CL. So we can rearrange these expressions. Um, to drag out the terms that depend on C and the terms that don't depend on C. The term that doesn't depend on C is this one. Now that's nice because L, the summation index, only shows up in CL. So this bit up here doesn't depend on CL at all. It's actually a constant that is the same for every single term in the sum. So let's just take that out of our sum. Nice. So now we're only left with one term in the sum so that we can think about this. So what is this? It's, well, it's um, a bunch of terms, f of them, and every individual one contains an exponential of a negative square, where we subtract CL from a number, which if we, once we fix xi and xj, that number is just a constant. It's just a number. So what we have here is a, is a sum over individual Gaussian factors, if you like, that all uh, that depend on different values CL and the same constant and the same width. So let's see what we can do with this particular object when we increase the number of feature of, of number of entries in this sum. And to do so, I'm, this is the next slide. What I've just done here is I've literally copied over the very final line of this slide onto the next one. So there's no change here. You can just look at this again for simplicity. And now what we're going to do is we're going to mentally increase the number of features towards infinity. But we're not going to just increase it in some arbitrary way, we're going to increase it in an extremely regular way. And what we'll do is we'll add more and more of these features to increase their density, but we will keep them at regular distances. So they will still be on a regular grid, it's just that the grid becomes finer and finer as we add more and more of these points. The distance between them becomes smaller and smaller. But we still keep the boundaries on the right and the left, 8 and minus 8, if you like. Then if we do so, then the number of features that is within a certain box of width delta c on this input domain, well, what's that number? Well, it's the, it's the total number of features, which is capital F, which we are increasing, times the relative amount of volume in that small box over the entire box. Right? So that relative amount of volume is the small box, the width of the small box, delta C, divided by the width of the whole box, C max minus C min. That's just how much volume of the entire measurable volume is in delta C. And now if we increase the number of features further, here we are a little bit vague, but I'm sure you're going to believe me, that this sum here then turns into a Riemann sum and actually into an integral. So as we increase Delta, uh, as we increase f and decrease delta c, asymptotically we're getting an infinite sum, which is called the Riemann integral, over these um, feature, these infinitely many feature functions, where each individual feature function is centered at c, and um, 
has a sort of a shift, well, sorry, it's evaluated at C, it has a shift that is given by this constant, one half xi plus xj. Now, what is this integral back here? Now here, that's the actual power of integration. So there are certain integrals that are just known, they're just closed form. So this here is a Gaussian integral, right? It's the integral over the exponential of minus a square. And we know the value of this integral, it's the difference between two error functions. Or actually, if we just increase c max and c min, so in increase c max towards infinity and decrease c min towards minus infinity, then this is just, um, so that means we're just assuming that the box that we're putting our features over becomes arbitrarily large. So now we have infinitely many features across the entire real line that lie infinitely dense close to each other. Then we have um, an integral here over Gaussian features and that's just a standard Gaussian integral. So we know what that is. It's just the square root of 2 pi times lambda. And if lambda is 1, this is the Gaussian integral and it's just the square root of 2 pi, right? So what we're left with is the bunch in front, which is constants, which don't depend on c. So that's sigma squared times this expression times this integral, which is just the square root of 2 pi times lambda. Interesting. So we've just managed to work with infinitely many features and yet still have an attractable expression for our inner product that is called this kernel function. And it's given by this particular expression, which is square root of 2 pi times lambda times sigma squared times the exponential of minus um, xi minus xj squared over 4 lambda squared. Notice that there is no relate no, no quantity in here that relates to the number of features or um, well yeah just a number of the features. So in fact I'm going to redefine or typically in when when this operation is when this function is used these constants sigma square and lambda are redefined a little bit so typically lambda is redefined to be lambda one half um, so that there's a two here and sigma is redefined to be sigma over the square root of two pi lambda so that there's just a constant sigma up here in front. But that doesn't really matter, it's just a renaming of the variables. Now notice that, um, well actually no, let me first show you this and let's see what, what's actually just happened here. So here is a pictorial view on what we've just done. Um, if you don't like the math, you can see a picture and then in a moment we'll look at the code. So we started by putting finitely many features on here, right? One, two, three, four, and there, in total there are eight here at the moment. Now I've increased the number of features. Here there are now, um, uh, I think in this plot there are uh, 32 or so of these features. You can still see them. There are finitely many of them. And as we increase the number of features, they still, they stay at a regular location and they stay between minus eight and eight. Asymptotically, it's actually possible to use arbitrarily many of these features and even increase the box arbitrarily wide to the left and the right. And we can still draw all the quantities that our code computes. We can still draw the, the prior mean function. We can draw this sausage of uncertainty, this error bar. Um, we can draw samples, that's what they look like. And we can even compute posterior distributions. This is what they look like. Even though we're using an infinitely wide neural network. What did we have to do to do that? Well, let's look at our code again. Um, dup, dup, dup. So here is our code from before. I haven't changed anything. And now I'm gonna, gonna um, do a little bit of a rearrangement of the, well, I, I, the only thing I have to change, let's go back up, right? So this is just plotting. Um, the only thing, okay, I can actually, um, maybe I can collapse the plotting bit so that we can see this. Okay, so here's our code from before, our Gaussian parametric regression, if you like. And here, I don't need to change anything because we've already encapsulated all the necessary operations in M and K, in the mean function and the kernel function. So all I need to do is redefine our kernel. So the mean function, I'm going to make things simple and just say the mean function is just a zero function because we assume that, either you could say we assume that the prior uh, mean of the weights is zero or you could say that whatever the prior mean of the weights is, I'm ju I've just subtracted some constant, which I'm allowed to do because it's a Gaussian inference, where right? I could subtract some b, which happens to have exactly that value. The tricky bit is going to be our kernel. So our kernel is now not going to explicitly take inner products between features anymore. Instead, it's directly going to be a function 
that takes in, and actually let me go back and show you this on the slide, it's directly going to be a function that takes in as its input xi and xj, and then just returns the evaluation of a function that um, uh, depends on xi and xj, right? And now we're going to build matrices out of these objects that take arbitrary pairs and sets of pairs of xi and xj. So to do that, we need to do a little bit of Python foo. For those of you who like programming, proper computer scientists, you're gonna like that. We're gonna define actually um, an abstract function, which we just call the kernel. So a kernel is a function of second order, if you like, which takes in a particular function. So in our case, that function is the exponential of a square and um, times a constant, and then returns another function, here it is, which is itself a function of two inputs. So it takes in an, an, a set of xi's and a set of xj's, and then for every pair, i and j, in, the, in those sets, it evaluates this function on xi and xj, and then does that for every possible pair of i and j, and then builds a, a matrix out of that, a potentially rectangular or square matrix. So that's the abstract operation, and we've decided to, or, or in our derivation, we've ended up with a, applying this particular function here to um, this process, which is that you take your inputs, xi and xj, let's, I call them a and b here, and then we return a constant, which I've here set to nine, you will see later why, times the exponential of the distance between the two inputs squared divided by two divided by some width, which I call L square here. And actually that width can be set to anything, so I'm already using um, an abstract form for this that we can sort of change later on. So let's use, uh, let's build a kernel from that, for that we call our kernel function and say, I want to have this function which can be applied to arbitrary uh, points, uh, groups of inputs, and for each of these inputs, just apply this particular function. So let's do that. I can run this code. And if I do this and then rerun the plotting code up here, hang on. Then we get, we can still do Gaussian inference on function values and we get out this differently, sli slightly differently shaped posterior because we're now using infinitely many feature functions to do this. Now, what I've just done here is I've defined two objects that are important that have a wide, widespread use. They're called a kernel and then this object that we've just constructed which you might have been wondering about what that is, and that's called a Gaussian process. Now these two words are big and fancy, um, and we're going to use them a lot over the course of the lecture, but actually um, you can think of them exactly in the way we just constructed them, and that's maybe more useful than the usual definitions you get to see, which are already cleaned up and made more elegant so that they work in a general sense. So here is a proper definition if we would have done this sort of from, from the front um, or top down by first defining all the objects. A kernel is obviously actually in like the slightly more proper mathematical definition is a Mercer kernel or sometimes it's also called a positive definite kernel is a bivariate function that takes two inputs from an input domain in our examples, those input domain was always the real line, but of course it can be many, many other different spaces um, and returns a real number such that, and here is this kind of weird definition that um, I just implemented in Python essentially, for any finite collection of input points, let's call them capital X for entries from X1 to Xn, the, the square matrix that you can construct by taking all pairwise expressions xi and xj and evaluating that function on them, if that function is always positive semi-definite, then this k is called a positive semi-definite kernel or a Mercer kernel. So a kernel is a second order function, a function that takes in numbers and then returns another function. So it takes in 
this function f, which in the example I just did is this exponential of a square function. And it returns another function, which is this thing that you can use to construct matrices. You give it a collection. Actually, you can give it two different collections, a collection A and a collection B. And then it returns a rectangular matrix of size length of A by length of B, where uh, for each possible pair in A and B, we evaluate this function f and build this matrix out of it. And here is kind of the proper Python code for doing that. Um, for uh, like as I just used it in our code. So just as a reminder, positive and definite, we've already talked about this, means that this um, matrix is, um, has the property that when we multiply from the left and the right, any arbitrary vector, we always get a positive or at most zero number. And as other ways of describing such matrices, they are matrices that have um, uh, symmetric matrices which have non-negative eigenvalues, or they can also be written as outer products of a bunch of uh, other vectors. So we, um, we didn't come across this kind of function in this form. Instead, I chose a particular set of features and then took inner products of these features and then used those to construct a covariance function for our Gaussian process. Now, so I need to show, you, to show to you that this process actually gives such a Mercer kernel. And here is a lemma that states that um, K is a Mercer kernel if it can be written as um, a, a sum over, um, so as an inner product, which is a sum over evaluations of some function phi evaluated at x and x prime. And in fact, I'm going to even allow for the more generic case, which I could just construct it with these Gaussian features of this sum being an integral over some domain of positive measure under some measure nu. Um, so you can think of what I just did here as the, the sort of the straightforward case where this measure was just a Lebesgue measure and I integrated from minus infinity to plus infinity over this sort of product of the same function evaluated at two different inputs. Why is that the case? Well, let's look at the sum case. If you have such a matrix and then you multiply from the left and the right uh, any vector v, then that's a double sum which just separates into two different um, into two different v, uh, 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 sums of the same form where if you look at them closely you notice that the, these two sums are actually the same so that's just, they're just a square of uh, a number and the square of a real number is always larger or equal than zero. So Therefore, if we construct our matrices in this form, if we construct these kernel functions in the form, we always get positive semi-definite Mercer kernels. Actually, it turns out that the opposite, with a, uh, subject to a few technical constraints, is also true that any such Mercer kernel can actually be written in such a form, but that proof is much, much harder, so I'm not going to do it. And then we use this object, this Mercer kernel, to define another concept, which is a probabilistic concept, which we, call the Gaussian, which we will call the Gaussian process. I've already constructed it for you for the specific case of this particular kernel, but here is a proper definition. Um, let mu, which we will call the mean function, be any function. It really doesn't matter what that function is. And let k be such a Mercer kernel. Then a Gaussian process, which we will write like this, um, so we will, we will talk about a probability measure that um, is constructed where in, implicitly, so I'm, actually I'm going to reuse this notation, which strictly speaking is a little bit dangerous because we don't know yet whether this is actually a probability measure, but it turns out that this notation actually works. We will write GP for Gaussian process over um, an object that is of type function with these uh, parameterized by these two objects. This is a probability distribution over a function that maps from the input domain, x, whatever it might be, to the real line, such that, and that's the actual definition, if we take any finite restriction, as we did in our code, in our Python code, both to make plots on regular plotting grids and for finite data sets. So if you take any such finite restriction to function values at particular locations, and here I'm using this notation that I've introduced two lectures ago with subscripts instead of brackets to evaluate functions. If the restriction of f to any such finite set 
If that's a Gaussian distribution with mean that is given by evaluating the mean function at those points and covariance that is given by evaluating the kernel at that point, then, that, then we call this a Gaussian process. So this definition is actually somewhat backward. It's just describing what I've just done in this construction. Where we've, we've noticed that we can construct covariance objects, covariance functions, which allow us to take any arbitrary sets of inputs, as long as they are finite, and always give back a positive semi-definite matrix. So therefore, of course, we can use that as a Gaussian distribution, and then we can do Gaussian regression, Gaussian parametric regression, well, Gaussian regression, let's forget about the parametric, using these objects. And now we just have to wonder, well, what does that mean, right? Are we, like, what are we actually doing here? Well, what we're doing is we've written a computer program. That's literally what we've done. A computer program that takes arbitrary inputs, test set and training set, and no matter what those inputs are, as long as they are finite and within the domain that we've specified, capital X or bold X, we always get out Gaussian distributions with which we can work. We always get out Gaussian prior means over the function values on the test set. We always get Gaussian prior covariances over those test sets. We get Gaussian distributions over the data set. And therefore, because we have a linear relationship between training and test set, the, um, sorry, a linear relationship between data observation, linear Gaussian relationship between the data and the function, we get a Gaussian positive over the function value f. Now, I've only done one particular construction for one specific choice of features for, of such a Gaussian process yet. And you might be thinking, okay, that means there is just this one sort of peculiar object, right? Where you take Gaussian features and you, you distribute them over the real line, over infinitely, infinitely far, infinitely dense, and then you get this kind of a single specific point of an infinitely wide neural network, and that kind of works. Now, it turns out that that's actually not so specific. There is a much larger set of such Gaussian process models. And to get a sense, actually that's what we're going to do for the rest of this lecture, we're gonna think about uh, trying to get a sense for how large this set is. So to do that, we'll first look at a few more features and see if we can keep, like redo this kind of construction that I just did for the Gaussian features with other features. So in a previous lecture, I, so two lectures ago, lecture seven, I, um, when we spoke about different features that we could use, I also introduced these step functions. I said that there are two different kinds of step functions. There are step functions that start at minus one and go to plus one, and then there are step functions that start at zero and go to one. Let's use those. So here are those feature functions again. They are, um, they, here in this picture, there are four of these feature functions. They always start at a certain point. The first one starts at minus eight, the second one at minus four, the next one at zero, and then at four. So there are four of these features, and they are given by these heavy side step functions. So step functions, so functions that become one when their argument is larger than zero. So what happens if we um, replace our Gaussian features in our construction from before with these heavy side step functions. So for that, um, let's say we actually do this on the blackboard or the whiteboard for a change. So let's say that we have feature functions of x and such that the feature function number L is given by this heavy side step function x minus c L. And we're gonna um, so, of course, we are again going to do this spiel that we will assume the prior covariance to be a diagonal matrix with a well specifically like smartly chosen constant in front. Um, let's not think about that constant yet. We can do that later to so make it work. The interesting object is going to be this sum, this inner product, which is a sum over the, actually, I mean, that is going to be phi transpose Sorry, that's going to be phi transpose um, x i my times the phi of x j. What is that? That's a sum of individual features L. There are capital F of them. I mean, you could even write that up here. 
uh, over heavy side step functions x i minus c l theta x j minus c l. Okay, what's that expression? Well, these are functions that are either zero or one. So if one of them is zero, then the whole product is zero. And then the entire term drops from the sum. So the only case in which we actually have a term here in the sum is if both xi is less than cl, uh, sorry, if xi is larger than cl, and xj is also larger than cl. So that means if the smaller of the two, xi or xj, the minimum of xi or xj is larger than cl, then we have a term. So we have here a sum over L over theta of the minimum of xi and xj minus cl. I'm actually going to give, give a name to this variable because writing the minimum of xi and xj is always a bit tricky, so I will just call that x bar. Oh, god damn it. So now um, the integral. So we are going to do the same kind of construction as before. We'll increase the number of features, capital F, towards infinity until we are essentially talking about a Riemann sum. So we will eventually need an integral from um, some lower bound. Let's call that lower bound C0 all the way up to some upper bound. Let's call that C max over this expression. So over a single heavy side step function, theta x bar minus c, d c. Now, and here we can reuse, like you do like a second step with, with uh, heavy side step functions. Of course, this expression again is going to be zero unless x bar is larger than xc. So we are essentially yeah integrating because we're integrating over c so c needs to be less than x bar we're integrating from c0 all the way to x bar not to c max over just the one function right plus a zero an integral over zero from c is x bar to c max and what is that well it's just x bar minus c0 so let me do that for you on slides. Here is a, a simplified form of this expression again, of, of this derivation again. Um, here's our, our, our feature. I've just defined it properly as this, um, as this uh, heavy side step function. Here's a constant that I've now smartly chosen. And here is just the derivation we just did. And we end up with a kernel function that is given by a constant times um, the minimum between xi and xj, that's our x bar, minus c0. By the way, of course, you can drag that c0 in here and just think of the minimum of xi minus c0 and xj minus c0. Okay, what does this look like in terms of pictures? So here is um, our uh, Gaussian regression model with step functions. Now I've used a little bit more, not the four anymore from before, but now there are I think uh, 16, one at each step, right, at each, at each location. And now we can increase that number of features more and more. And you see that asymptotically, we get an object that actually has a finite variance. So notice, by the way, that as we move back and forward, this is maybe a good point to say this, uh, from here to there and forward, the scale of the y-axis stays constant. I'm not changing the scale of the plot. And that means that even though we increase the number of features here, the variance of this process does not increase arbitrarily. This seems like a good thing, right? Because you don't want to have a model that is arbitrarily flexible, that has infinite variance. And the way we achieve this is in this construction by dividing the variance by the number of features. So that as we increase the number of features in here, we also decrease this constant proportionally, and therefore we remain with a finite variance. So of course this is good from a modeling perspective because we want to have a model that isn't infinitely flexible. Um, because then we're we'll, we'll also infinitely uncertain and if we're infinitely uncertain that might be a bad thing to, to be. And then we might not be able to learn anything. However, of course it also, if you think of this from a sort of deep learning perspective, this also means that as we increase 
the number of weights in our network towards infinity, the scale of their individual weights also drops proportionally to the number. So that means each individual feature only contributes an infinitesimally small amount to the overall model. And you could wonder whether that doesn't constrain the power of these models in some sense. And of course it does, and we'll find out how in next week's lecture, or the next lecture actually. Okay, so it turns out that there is this limiting process. Here it is. And um, it has this covariance function. And you might think that this is just an arbitrary one that I've chosen because I've sort of picked these, these weird step functions which might be fun to do. But actually, um, this is in many ways maybe the most fundamental Gaussian process, at least it's historically the most important Gaussian process that was studied first. Why? Because um, it's interesting in physics, it's, um, you can think of this process that happens here as the kind of path you get by taking a particle, putting it at, at um, location zero at time C0, so here I've set C0 to be uh, 8, right, here, and um, actually minus 8, minus 8 to C0 here, right, this point, and now what happens is that as we go forward through this, well, let's call it time, then at every point in time, there is an infinitesimal kick that this particle gets, and that kick is distributed according to a Gaussian, an independent Gaussian, right? Because that's exactly the construction we have. So at every single point in time, there's this new feature being switched on, and it has a weight that, has, that is independent of all the previous ones, and it scales with a constant divided by the number of features. So it's infinitesimally small. But there are also infinitesimally, infinitesimally many of them. And now what this particle does is it, it does a random walk across time forward in time. And that's actually what particles in a free gas do. This is called Brownian motion. And um, Albert Einstein actually got, uh, well, he didn't get the Nobel Prize for this. It's one of the four papers that he wrote during his Annus Mirabilis is on Brownian motion, on exactly this kind of stochastic process. At the same year, he also wrote papers on the photo effect and on, uh, on specific relativity. He actually ended up getting the Nobel, the Nobel Prize for uh, the photo effect, but this paper probably was just as important. And it um, was, is maybe arguably one of the first proper mathematical descriptions of this stochastic process called the Wiener process, actually, um, Brownian motion. And here you see sort of an, ex an excerpt from his um, original paper. What you see here is a, a probability distribution over the location x of a particle, so x is our output, this one here, at a time t. And what Einstein is showing here is that this probability density that corresponds to, to, this, uh, to this location, so the probability to be at location x at time t is given by a Gaussian distribution that has something to do with the number of particles and the normalization constant of a Gaussian, which we already know, times Gaussian expression over the location scaled by a, a standard deviation, sorry, scaled by a variance that is growing linearly in time. And this d is a diffusion constant that has something to do with physics, but other than that, this is exactly this kind of curve that we see here. And by the way, if you do regression with this kind of curve, then you get this kind of posterior, which is a nice um, maybe regression model in some sense. It's nice because it creates um, an, an interpolant between the data, that's this solid red line, which is piecewise linear. Why is it piecewise linear? Well, remember, like think about what the Gaussian, what this posterior is of this, um, of this uh, regression function. It's the, where do we have that? Let me go back and show you the corresponding slides. Oop. The posterior mean of this, function of x is the prior mean, which we've set to zero. So this is a zero and this is a zero. And then we have the data here and a matrix that we get to invert. And then on the left hand side, we have this matrix, which contains evaluation of this kernel function. So the, um, at, for, the, for the point little x, this here is a row matrix that evaluates the kernel at all the test locations, capital X, at all the training locations, capital X. And all these kernels are of this minimum form now. So they are all individually, each entry in, that, in this rectangular matrix is of this form. So this is assuming that um, the test point is larger than the, than the training location. 
that's a linear function. And the sum of a linear functions is another linear function, which is why what you see here as an interpolant are always piecewise linear functions. And they have a kink at every data point because at every data point there is one new step being switched on. This connection to physics is actually, um, I, I actually recommend that you have a look at this paper if, you're, if you can read in German, I mean of course there's an English translation as well, um, it might be a fun read in an afternoon or an evening to, uh, to read this original paper by Einstein, not because it gives you much insight into, into stochastic processes or Gaussian processes in particular, but because it gives you a feeling for how advances in physics were, cons I mean, fundamental, seminal advances in physics were constructed just over 100 years ago, and maybe it gives you a feeling for why machine learning might be a mechanical continuation of this process and our field actually still works in these relatively non-mathematical ways that um, arguably Einstein was following as well. I'm not saying that he was a, he was a stupid man at all but he uses um, a relatively concrete approach to mathematics that we're now also commonly using in um, our field. So okay this was our construction for the um, the stochastic process that describes Brownian motion, so that which creates these paths, which are instances of Brownian motion, which is called the Wiener process, which is a Gaussian process, and it gives rise to these interpolants, which are piecewise linear, and they are sometimes called linear splines. Great, you might think, but of course you're a self-respecting machine learner, and you're not using features like step functions, nobody does that anymore, everyone these days is using rectified linear units and clearly of course those are somehow much more powerful right and relus are like a, this wonderful type of feature and surely these can't be connected to any Gaussian process well let's see what we can do about rectified linear units these are also connected to some Gaussian process for that I need to briefly clean up my whiteboard such that you can actually see what I'm going to be drawing Okay, so let's say we're instead of our um, piecewise constant functions, step functions, we use piecewise linear functions as our features. So notice that we put with, with features which were piecewise constant functions, we just got piecewise linear interpolants. Now we're going to use piecewise linear features. Let's see what kind of interpolants those give us. So let's say we use features phi L which are given by, of x, which are given by um, theta, so the step function x minus some location cl times x minus cl. So that's a ReLU feature, right? A feature that looks like this, where here is cl. Now, um, let's take inner products of these features. If uh, we put them at some location, then we get phi x transpose phi x, which is a sum of individual terms. And let's just write them both down and directly sort them a little bit. There's going to be two heavy side step functions x and x prime, x prime, or let's call them xi and xj, so that we are as before, x i x j the sum is over l uh, minus c l times x i minus c l times x j minus c l. Um, and just as before, just as for the step functions, now here's a product of two heavy side step functions. They are going to be this product is going to be zero if one of them is zero. So we can instead think of the sum over l over theta, let me write this sum function, um, of the minimum of xi and xj, which again I'm going to be calling x bar minus cl, because cl is the same in both expressions, times that bit at the end. And then we can already expand that a little bit to see what it's going to be. It's going to be a a uh, quadratic term in C, right? So there will be a CL squared, and then minus a linear term in CL, which has XI plus XJ in here, and then, uh, well, in quotation marks, quadratic term. So that's a term where we multiply XI and XJ. Now, what happens if we increase the number of features? So 
Here, since we are trying to make a connection to deep learning and rectified linear units, we have to be a little bit careful about how exactly we generalize. So there are actually various different ways of placing these rectified linear units in a regular fashion over some domain. We're going to view one of them, which is that we put these rectified linear units all pointing in the same direction from the left end to the right end. So that's basically the analogous thing to what, we, what I've previously done with the other features. But of course, these VLUs have this kind of symmetry towards the right, or non-symmetry towards the right. So you can also define them the other way around, right? You can also say, maybe I could have another feature which points in the other direction and moves up here. And then um, maybe we could have both of these. So you could have a construction where you have two linear features that are separate from each other, always at different points. All of this is possible. And maybe if you want to do that for yourself, you can try it out. Um, I'm just going to assume, and these will, these will give rise to different kernels, right? So what I'm going to assume is that we have a regular set of these features that are being switched on one, um, one after the other, and they are um, asymptotically dense, so we'll put more and more and more of these onto our grid and increase their number until we get a Riemann integral that goes from a left end where the process starts, where it is at zero, from uh, C0 all the way to C max. And then we get this expression inside integrated over C. Right, so theta of x bar minus C times C squared minus C times xi plus xj plus xi xj dc. Now, we can do the exact same thing as before for our linear splines, for the step functions, for Brownian motion. This integral contains only, like the integrand here is only non-zero if the integral, if, if this expression is larger than zero, so that means that c is less than x bar, so we only integrate up until x bar. And now I need to be careful that I have the space to write that down, so you can still see it, let's see. Um, well, what's that integral going to be? Well, it's one third of c cubed, where c is evaluated both at x bar and at c zero. So that's x bar cubed minus c zero cubed minus one half c squared. It's just a polynomial integral, right? Times um, evaluated at x bar and at c zero times x i plus x j plus a uh, constant, so that's x bar minus c0 times xi xj. I'm not sure you can still see that, but you can maybe do it for yourself. So this expression um, is actually typically not written down this way, but that's our kernel already. What people often then do is that they rearrange this expression um, and end up with this kind of covariance matrix. I leave it to yourself to check whether this expression I've just written down here is actually the same as the one I just derived on the, on the whiteboard. It's maybe a little fun exercise of playing around with minimum expressions to see that they're still the same. Um, and here I've, well, okay, I've used x0 rather than c0, but you can probably make do that for yourself. This construction of a kernel that arises from, from summing up or integrating up an infinite sum a number of rectified linear units features is connected historically with this wonderful lady. She's called Grace Waba. Uh, she's an American um, statistician. In, uh, she wrote together with her uh, PhD advisor a wonderful book on um, her PhD advisor, uh, a wonderful paper actually on, um, on uh, uh, these kind of models and then published a book later on by herself, I just noticed called Spline Models for Observational Data. It's a beautiful book that arose before the machine learning community proper existed and actually introduces a large number of these, of these models already um, in, a, in a, a relatively generic, uh, general and, and uh, almost universal kind of form. What kind of model is this going to give us? So here's a pictorial view again. Like we've just done the math, now we should do a little bit of, of, of pictures. Um, here are our features, in this, uh, as in previous plots, initially four, one, two, three, four features. Now we increase the number of features to more and more VLU features, and you see that the stochastic process stays in the same range because we're proportionally scaling the variance down 
And asymptotically, we get this kind of smooth like uh, process with sample paths that are this really smooth paths. And you can actually draw from the associated Gaussian process as well. And this process has various different names as well. One way to think about it is that it is an integral over the Wiener process. Why? Because, let me go back to this slide, this rectified linear unit feature is actually an integral over a heavy side step function, right? It's an integral that goes, that remains zero until you hit C, CL and then it becomes a linear function rather than a, a step function. And that means we can think of the stochastic process, the Gaussian process that arises from taking these features and then applying to the outside this integration operation, which is a linear operation, right? Integrals are just sums. So therefore, this, the associated Gaussian process is actually, can also be constructed by applying this linear map to the Gaussian process for Brownian motion. And therefore, this associated process is the so-called integrated Brownian motion or integrated Wiener process prior. That, however, is maybe not the most interesting connection from a machine learning perspective. The more, perhaps more interesting connection is the shape of these interpolants here. So this is the posterior that we get when we use this prior, this Gaussian process prior on this data set. It starts at zero, of course, because our process has a uh, leftmost point where it is zero because all the features are switched off and now there's an infinite number of features with infinitely small variance being added up and you can see that the interpolant in the middle this red line is now a smooth function it's not piecewise linear anymore it's actually piecewise polynomial why because it's still a sum a weighted sum over the kernel functions and here is our kernel function again at various um, uh, well, at or, 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 uh, summed up over all the input points, right? And those kernel functions are, as you can see, cubic polynomials, or also as you could see from my construction here. Now, that means the, that the interpolant is a sum over cubic polynomials, so that means it's another cubic polynomial, and it's the cubic polynomial which asymptotically, as the error bars go to zero, actually go through all the data points. There's only one such polynomial, and that's called the cubic spline. So cubic spline interpolation is actually a specific form of Bayesian inference called Gaussian process regression with the integrated Wiener process kernel, which, has, which was maybe for the first time properly written down or derived at least in this fashion by Grace Wamba. And with that, we are at another Grace slide, a summary of what we've done in the lecture so far. We've seen that these parametric models, parametric Gaussian regression models, can sometimes be extended not by adding more layers to the neural network, but by extending the number of units in it towards an infinite limit. And if you're lucky, then and if we manage to use a particular choice of features and distribute these features in the right way, such that as the sum, the entries of sum in, uh, goes towards infinity, we approach an asymptotic regular regime in which we can do the sum in a closed form as a Riemann integral, then we arrive at a still tractable, entirely tractable model, which is called a non-parametric model because we're not keeping track of individual features anymore, only of their interactions, of the interactions of an infinite sum of such linear models and that this particular kind of non-parametric model is called a Gaussian process. Inference in these Gaussian process models remains tractable even though we are simultaneously tracking an infinite number of features. It remains tractable because we are never actually talking about the individual feature, we're talking about the associated posterior over the function that we're trying to regress on, and if we're quite honest, it also remains tractable because we increase the number of features while simultaneously and proportionally reducing the variance of the associated weights. Maybe a point to keep in mind is that we still need to do Gaussian inference, so we still need to invert that covariance matrix, and that's of course going to be cubic in the number of entries in the data set, so cubic in, in uh, n, because we have to invert a matrix of size number of data points by number of data points. In previous lectures, 
I've shown you how to do inference with parametric regression, which uh, allowed this reformulation of the, of the prior onto the weight space using the sure complement. And that was actually faster. It was, uh, it, it was associated with a cost that is cubic in the number of features, but linear in the number of data points. In Gaussian process regression, we cannot do this anymore because there is no weight space to talk about anymore. Or if you wanted to, it would have to happen in this infinite dimensional weight space, the space of infinitely many features, which of course is way more expensive than any data set. So that's a downside of this approach is that at least in principle and on paper, it's cubically expensive in the number of data points. Now there are all sorts of smart approximations out there, which I don't have time to talk about here today, which actually do allow to reduce the complexity of this kind of inference using approximate methods. In principle though, these methods are cubically expensive in the number of data points. Now, I did the initial construction by showing you how to construct one particular kernel, which is called the RBF kernel, the radial basis function kernel, or also the square exponential kernel, or the squared exponential kernel, or the Gaussian kernel. But now we just saw in the last few minutes that we can actually do a very analogous construction using other kinds of features and other asymptotic limits of infinitely many features. We did this specifically with piecewise, step, piecewise constant step functions, heavy side functions, and this gave rise to a very popular, very famous Gaussian process called the Wiener process, which has as its kernel this minimum kernel. It gives rise to positive mean functions which are piecewise linear and therefore um, this is called the linear spline, even though, and maybe I should make this more explicit, um, one thing to notice is the, piece, the posterior interponent is, is linear, but the samples are not. The samples are actually very rough. It can even be shown that these samples are non-differentiable almost everywhere, but we'll talk about that in the next lecture. Um, and then just for fun, and maybe for a connection to contemporary deep learning, I pointed out that the infinitely wide limit of a ReLU regression network is actually also a Gaussian process and it's associated with this kernel at least under one certain construction of these features and that's called the cubic spline kernel. There are other ways of distributing the ReLU features across the input domain. They give rise to other forms of kernels but all of these kernels always are in polynomial in the inputs and they are of cubic order polynomially. They give rise to a slightly different shape but um, their interpolants still remain cubic splines. It's just different types of cubic splines. So you might, if you've worked with splines before, you might know that they are different cubic splines, uh, natural ones and less natural ones. And this, these are maybe the natural cubic splines, natural in the sense that they extrapolate outside of the data in a linear fashion. There are other such kernels and in the, over the course of like, the history of our field, various other kernels have been constructed in a very similar fashion to what I just did with these three examples. For example, there is a kernel called the neural network kernel, which uh, was uh, derived by Chris Williams in 1998, which is based on a construction where you use other kinds of features, sigmoidal features, rather than um, piecewise linear features, because that was during a time when people weren't so keen on redo features. But it might seem a bit tedious to do that, and you might get the impression that by um, um, these kind of constructions, we essentially have to take, we always have to start with some kind of neural network structure and then extend the number of features and try to find a particular limit. And that seems very constrained, right? Because it almost seems like we are inheriting all the problems of deep learning by having to use these feature sets and then man like manually manipulating them. But actually that's not true. It turns out that these four examples here are really just that, just examples. And the space of all Gaussian processes, spanned by the space of all kernels, is actually very large and continuous. And that's because you can build new kernels from old ones. For example, using these here as starting points and then manipulating these kernels to get new models. And doing so creates an extremely powerful modeling language which we are going to deal with over the next few lectures as well. I want to show you a few examples of how to use this modeling language to build very expressive models, probabilistic models, which allow tractable inference and also allow you to encode a lot of structural information about your problem a priori 
by including things you really tangibly know, manifestly know about your problem. To explore this space and identify this space of kernels, we um, can remind ourselves that kernels are implicitly defined through their property that they give rise to positive definite matrices. So a kernel is a function such that when you evaluate it on a bunch of points and building a matrix out of it is positive definite. Therefore, we can think about all the operations you can do on positive definite matrices and therefore identify the space of kernels. So what are these operations? Well, um, you can do the following four operations on kernels and this means that essentially kernels span what's called a semi-ring. So if you have a kernel already and you multiply it with a positive number, then you still get a kernel. Why is that? Well, you can do that in a one-liner. If you have a matrix such that any vector multiplied from the left and the right always gives a, a number larger than zero, then if you multiply that number by a positive number, of course you still get a positive number. Right? And that's the same as multiplying the entries of this matrix, each, every individual one, by alpha. Another operation you can do is you can take a kernel and map its inputs through some feature functions. Or equivalently, think of its inputs as mapped through some feature function. Why does that work? Because um, kernels, actually, I mean, I didn't tell you, well, I kind of insinuated that every kernel can be written as this outer product form. I only showed it the other way around. But let's say we have a kernel that can be written in this inner product form, then um, we know that this is positive definite because by our proof for that was if you take this such a matrix and multiply it from the left and right with a, with a vector, then uh, if you get, take a matrix that arises from taking elements of some collection of x and evaluating for every possible pair of entries of that collection the, the, these numbers and building a matrix out of it, that's positive definite. You can show that that's positive definite by multiplying from the left and the right with a vector and noticing that that expression essentially amounts to taking squares of real numbers. Now that remains a square if we take the input x to phi and transform it through some other function that maps onto the same space, of course, so that phi still works. Then the proof still works, so clearly this is still a kernel. The next operation we can do is we can take two kernels and sum them together because the sum of two real numbers that are larger than zero is larger than zero. And finally, we can take two kernels and multiply them with each other. Here I don't mean the product of two matrices, but you just take the actual function, the kernel function, and multiply it with another kernel function. And the resulting matrix, which is actually a matrix that is the so-called Hadamard product, so the element-wise product of the, of the uh, individual matrices, happens to also be positive definite. This final statement is actually totally non-trivial and it's not easy to show. Um, it's known as the sure product theorem and if you want to understand how it works you actually need to read a proper proof for it. Nevertheless, we can use all four of these properties to create new Gaussian process models from existing kernels and that will give rise to our modeling language. We're going to use that in a later lecture to build an, like a, a, a concrete model. Now I just want to give you an intuitive feeling for what these individual operations do. So let's first look at scaling the output, so scaling the kernel itself. What that amounts to is um, scaling this um, dimension of the process, if you like, so the output dimension. Why? Because, so here's our kernel, I'm using for all these plots, I'm using the Gaussian kernel, this smooth one that uses this expression, but of course you could use any other kernel. Remember that the variance of this Gaussian process is given by, so these, these, thin, these thin horizontal line, these arrow bars, are given by the uh, diagonal elements of the kernel covariance matrix, the Graham matrix, which are of course scaled by this number. So if we increase that number, then what's going to happen is that the process becomes wider or scaled up in this dimension. This actually has a somewhat non-trivial effect on the posterior, which I'm plotting here on the right-hand side. If I go back and forth and you keep at your attention focused on this part of the, of the data, then you see that this interpolant actually becomes steeper or less steep. The reason this happens is that this kernel gram matrix also shows up in the data covariance and there it gets uh, added to the diagonal, in this case, covariance matrix of the data, of the likelihood. And 
by scaling up the prior, what we're essentially doing here is we're telling the model to rely more on the data and less on the prior. So it adapts a little bit more aggressively to the prior. The next operation, I, um, so right, we, can scale the, we can scale the output and that essentially scales the output variance and makes the model a little bit more flexible inside of the data. The next operation I introduced was that we can scale the inputs of, of a kernel. So we can scale, we can introduce new features. Um, or we can map the inputs through some feature functions. A particularly simple feature function is a linear rescaling. So just uh, taking the input and just multiplying it by a number. In this case here, I've multiplied all the inputs by the number one over five. So I've divided by five. And what that does is it takes the inputs and basically like stretches them out by a factor of five and the corresponding process is much smoother like it now uh, um, the samples now oscillate on a scale that is scaled up by a factor of five and that also is visible in the interpolant which becomes a much smoother function you can do this the other way around and scale by um, two basically so um, multiply by one over 0.5 squared and that gives a process that is now much much more rough it, into, it oscillates on a shorter time scale and you can see what this does to our posterior distribution. It becomes more flexible inside of a data domain and it becomes more conservative in extrapolation. But remember that we, I more generally didn't just say that we, have, that we are allowed to multiply the inputs by some number. We're actually allowed to map this, uh, these inputs through an arbitrary feature function. It doesn't have to be a linear one. So for example, here, I'm mapping the inputs through a quadrat, or actually a cubic function, is that like what I apply to the kernel. And what this means is that the process over here becomes much more flexible because this is a region where the cubic feature is large. So locally the features get more scrunched together, or the inputs. And on the left hand side, this function becomes much, much flatter. So the process becomes more regular here as well. This is a way to produce flexibility in your regression model in very specific locations and remove it in other locations. So here we have a model that extrapolates very smoothly on the left hand side and very conservatively on the right hand side. I also said that we can add two kernels together to get a new one. Here for this particular plot I've added two kernels. One is this Gaussian kernel that we've seen on previous plots. And the other one is actually a trivial kind of kernel that is just actually an inner product of features. It's the kind of kernel that we used in, the, in lecture seven or at the very beginning of this lecture. One that isn't an infinite sum, it's just a finite sum. But of course that's also a kernel because it, has, it fulfills all the properties of the definition of a kernel. And the resulting model produces um, locally this kind of smooth flexibility of the, of the Gaussian kernel. But globally, it creates this additional cubic interpolation ability of this, um, uh, this cubic, oh, well, sorry, quadratic interpolation ability of this parametric model. And you can see what this does to your model. It allows you to create sort of global structure, learn that this function might have some kind of bell-shaped, bowl-shaped uh, structure, and um, add like more aggressive extrapolation abilities. And finally, we can multiply two kernels together to get a new kernel. Remember, or maybe notice that plus and times are similar to and and or in our uh, in, in uh, sort of um, interaction space. So the kernel defines a, uh, the covariance, right? So in some sense, sort of the relationship between two uh, variables in, uh, in their marginal distribution. So if the kernel is zero, that means two variables become marginally independent. And if the kernel has a large value, then they become uh, uh, marginally very dependent. Now, the sum of a, a, a large and a small number is a large number, but the product of a large and a small number is a small number. So the product of two kernels gives rise to a covariance structure such that um, if one of the kernels, if under one of the kernels, uh, two points are independent of each other, they become independent under this model, while the sum of two kernels gives rise to a structure where if the two, two points in the input domain are correlating with each other under one of the kernels, then they um, correlate under the sum of these two kernels. So here I've taken a sum, we just talked about this, and here's a product. 
So now um, I'm just for fun using a different kind of kernel. So here there's just a single feature function, which is this quadratic function. Um, and I'm multiplying this with this Gaussian kernel. What this gives us is a stochastic process that has the shape of this feature function. So it um, only allows uh, kind of large function values here on the far right hand side but locally produces this smooth kind of uh, behavior of this uh, Gaussian kernel. So this of course has just been a rough whirlwind tour and we'll do an entire lecture, two lectures after this, to talk about how to use this kind of structure to create uh, specific models for very specific applications. What we've already seen though, in just on a high level with this, is that the space of Gaussian process models is actually not consisting of individual points of kernels that you have to construct by hand and find laboriously. No, you can take these individual starting point kernels and create new kernels out of them by applying these quite powerful analytic transformations that map from one kernel to another. You can scale the output, you can scale the input, you can add and you can multiply kernels with each other to arrive at new Gaussian process models. Now in many ways this is great because it means that the span of the space of Gaussian processes is very large. That we can build complicated models out of these kernels and use specific kernels to encode certain kinds of structure like certain smoothness, certain length scales, certain output scales. We can calibrate our uncertainty. But of course it's also a challenge because just as in the case of deep learning where now, or in feature learning, representation learning, we now have this issue that we have to take these decisions. What began maybe as an exercise to get rid of all these parameters in our model has now actually just introduced new parameters. And if you know certain aspects of your data set, then you can use this modeling language to reflect these or to include these aspects into your model. But if you don't know them, then of course you unfortunately have to figure out a way to set them. Now thankfully, and this is the final point I just want to briefly make on the side and then we can deal and like talk in, in detail about how to do this in practice later, we can of course use the same ideas that we used in the last lecture to talk about how to learn features to now learn kernels. So here is a slide that we've essentially used on, on, uh, or, on, on the previous lecture already. Remember that when we do Gaussian regression, we can construct not just a posterior over the function given some data and a bunch of features or parameters of the features. We can also compute the model evidence, this term down here, and that model evidence in the feature formulation at least actually is itself of a Gaussian form. So it's a number that can be computed by evaluating a Gaussian PDF with a bunch of means and covariances. And those means and covariances depend on the features and of course therefore on their parameters. In the last lecture we spoke about how to use this quantity to learn these representations by maximizing this expression as a function of theta. Now notice that these expressions in here actually are also, of, they only also include these quantities that we've been using to abstract away to non-parametric models. Here's a mean function and here's a kernel function. So just as in, in a previous lecture we could maximize this expression to learn how to set the individual parameters of individual features, we can of course also use the exact same framework to learn the parameters that affect the entire population of infinitely many features. Now there's no more time today, or at least in this lecture, depending on when you watch it on YouTube, to um, actually show you how to do this in practice. I just wanted to point out that of course it's possible. And then we will come back to this in a later lecture when we do a concrete example of, um, that shows how to construct a Gaussian process model for a very specific application to extract a specific uh, set of information, even scientific facts from real world data. For today, we're at the end. We saw today that there is another way to make Gaussian parametric regression models more powerful. Not by tuning the individual features and to do so create a powerful feature parameterization language called deep learning, but instead 
to increase the number of features, not in depth, but in width, if you like, towards infinity in the hope of creating a model that has infinitely many degrees of freedom. And we saw that this is in fact possible and um, there were maybe two prices we had to pay for this. One was that we had to make very specific choices about which features we are considering and how they relate to each other in terms of structure. We had to distribute them in a certain regular fashion. And the other price we had to pay was that we had to reduce the variance of the individual features in this infinite set towards zero. Otherwise, we would have gotten an ill-specified model. Nevertheless, it's possible to do that, and it gives rise to a new class of models, which we call Gaussian process models. These are also called non-parametric models because they hide the parameters, or if you like, they have infinite numbers of parameters, which are not an explicit part of the model. They are hidden inside of the kernel operation, which keeps track of infinitely many features at the same time. Maybe a third price, a computational one we have to pay, is that there is now no weight space anymore, at least not a weight space that has a finite size, that it might even be less than the number of data points. And therefore, we have to do the inference in function value space, which means that it's always, uh, it always requires the inversion of a matrix of size, number of data points by number of data points. So that's cubic in the number of, of data points, at least in principle. Okay, period. And we, even though we did the initial construction in terms of specific models, very specific kinds of families of features, we then realized that actually there is an entire space of such models, a very large and expressive space, in fact, that is spanned by various operations you can do on positive definite matrices to get back other positive definite matrices. We can take a kernel and multiply it with a positive number. This corresponds in the corresponding Gaussian process model to scaling the prior uncertainty of the model in the output space. We can take a kernel and, well, at first we can just scale the inputs, so that corresponds to scaling the input space, but we realize that we don't, we don't necessarily have to use a linear scale here. We can actually take an arbitrary transformation of the input domain, including a nonlinear one, to get um, a nonlinear rescaling of the input space and um, still remain within the sort of Gaussian process formal language. We can add two kernels uh, to each other and we can multiply them together to get new kernels. This, um, so adding a, a model that arises from the sum of two kernels implies that if two input uh, locations are correlated under one of these models, then they are correlated under the sum of these models, while the product is in some sense the opposite that says if two points are independent of each other under one, one of the models, so if the kernel is zero for one of them, then they are independent under the product um, model. Using this language, we can create a very powerful formalism that creates a large class of interesting regression algorithms which can, once the kernel is specified, can perform regression in, well, cubic time in the number of data points, but using just linear algebra, which is still a very powerful framework. It's maybe a bit of a downside that, uh, of this flexibility that even if you're not using it to construct your model and encode prior information, you still have to like, accept the fact that you could, of course, do so. So by not doing it, you are implicitly still encoding a certain kind of prior information that you might not actually believe in. To address this issue, at least to some degree, we can use the same framework, type 2 maximum likelihood, that we introduced in the previous lecture for parametric models to learn the parameters of kernel models of Gaussian process regression algorithms to tune these additional aspects of the model to data um, as it, it arises. Gaussian process models are one of the most important parts of the modeling language of probabilistic machine learning. And so they are going to get their own place in our toolbox. Um, you might, I might have um, also written Gaussian processes here, but then this might be confusing with the Gaussian distributions, which is why I wrote kernel models here, kernels. 
Um, they are so important, in fact, that we're going to spend several lectures talking about what to do with them. There will be one lecture that is more hands-on, thinking about how to um, use them on a concrete data set. There will be several lectures on how to extend them to data that doesn't quite fit into the Gaussian process language. And uh, in fact, Gaussian process models are also one point where the connection to the statistical formalism for machine learning is particularly close. So I'm going to use one more lecture um, to make, to, to talk a little bit about the theoretical aspects of these kernel models and how they relate to the other way of thinking theoretically about machine learning, which is statistical machine learning. All of this though is going to happen in later lectures. I hope that you enjoyed this lecture and I'm hoping to see you again in the next one. Thank you for your time.